Well, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Glenn Nowak. I'm a member of the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications, the director of their new Center for Health and Risk Communications, and just returned to Grady after spending 14 years at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Before that, I was at Grady, uh, starting back in 1989. And when I arrived here, I, I did a number of projects for the Centers for Disease Control. I didn't come to UGA um, as a risk communications person, but when I started working with CDC, I quickly became involved in projects that involved risk communications. And when I got involved in those projects, I started looking at um, who are the experts? Who should I be reading? Who should I be learning from? Peter was the person who quickly rose to the surface. And I've had the opportunity to work with Peter over the past few decades. Um, I've had an opportunity to learn from Peter, and so it's with a great deal of uh, honor that I'm really excited the fact that we were able to get Peter and his wife, Joey Lennard, who's a health communications, risk communications expert in her own right, to come and spend a few days with us. And so um, Peter is one of the founding fathers of the field of risk communications. He's been involved in a number of risk issues, crisis issues, over the span of his career, including Three Mile Island, as well as pandemic influenza. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to Peter to let him talk to you about some of the things that he has learned in his journey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm on a cordless mic so that uh, I can wander around and talk and you won't have any trouble hearing me. Uh, let me make sure it's working. W would you raise your hand if two things are simultaneously true? You can't hear me and you want to. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if at any point in the course of the next hour those two tech specs are met at the same time, let me know uh, and I'll talk louder or lift the microphone closer to my, uh, to my mouth or something. Uh, we are scheduled to run from 4 until 5. Uh, Glenn advised me to try to wrap up at about 10 to 5. That's his way of trying to get me to stop by 5 because uh, he knows me and I, I, I'm famous for running over. Uh, so I will, as you suggested, aim for 10 to 5 and finish at 5 um, uh, when uh, someone else is using the room. So you can be sure we won't run, <laughs> we won't run past 5. Um, uh, for that reason, let me encourage you, if you have comments or questions or examples or counterexamples to anything I say, raise them in real time. Uh, raise your hand, ask a question, make a comment. If you wait for the Q&A, the Q&A is going to happen after five out in the hall. Um, and you're welcome to do that. I mean, particularly if you would rather ask a question privately, uh, feel free to wait till five, but, but don't wait for a formal Q&A because there isn't going to be a formal Q&A. Uh, and feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, if you like what you hear in the next hour, uh, you can get more of the same, a great deal more of the same, by going to my website, uh, www.psandman.com. Uh, my goal in life is to get everything I know on my website and retire. Uh, and, and I have come, I'm coming close, I'm coming close. So, uh, uh, so feel free to make use of that resource. Um, okay, I, I want to get a sense of who's here. We are not going to go around the room and introduce ourselves. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if your field, in your judgment, if the thing you, you, know, you love most uh, intellectually is risk communication or health communication or something in that area. Okay. Raise your hand if it's communication but not, it's not especially risk or health. And raise your hand if it's not especially communication but this looked like a pleasant place to spend an hour. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, so we, have, we have a number of, of, of health and risk communication people, but we also have quite a number of people for whom this is new material, uh, and that, that is just fine. Uh, when Glenn and I were planning this event, um, uh, I sent Glenn a list of about five or six topics that I thought would be useful, uh, and he very helpfully replied that he wanted me to cover all of them. Uh, he said, why not do a potpourri, a little of this and a little of that? And I said, well, that wouldn't be coherent. And he said, it doesn't have to be coherent. Just, <laughs> just make it interesting. Um, is that a fair summary of the conversation? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so what the decision was to cherry pick a variety of things uh, from various corners of the risk communication territory. Um, 
Uh, the downside of that is that I'm not going to overview the risk communication territory in any kind of organized way, nor am I going to pick one corner of it and fill it in in any kind of detail. Uh, what this presentation will be most like is an airline magazine. Uh, where you get a little bit of what's fun in Shanghai followed by a little bit of what's fun in Athens uh, and so on and so on. So this is going to be the airline magazine version of risk communication. Um, uh, and I entitled it Communicating Risk, Neglected and Controversial Rules of Thumb. Uh, and the first rule of thumb that I want to talk about is put not your faith in information. That doesn't sound, that sounds more like a commandment than a rule of thumb, but uh, uh, so I, I can reframe it as don't put so much faith in information, and that has more of a rule of thumb feel to it. Uh, it in ways that I think a lot of us are familiar with, a great deal of health communication is literally purposeless. Uh, that is, uh, the purpose is purely administrative. It's been two months since our last press release on this topic. So we have to get one out this week. Uh, and you get one out, and you check that off, and you, you know, you've done that. Uh, but when there is a purpose beyond you know, m you know, the checklist, the purpose is more often than not information transmission. The articulated purpose is to get some specified information into the hands and ideally into the minds of some specified group of people. Now, information transmission, I think, is a sensible purpose if one of two things is true. The first thing that may be true is you think it's obvious that if people have this information, they'll do what you want them to do. And the other reason information might be useful is if you don't care what they do once they get the information. You just want them to get the damn information. Uh, and once they have it, it doesn't matter to you what they do. I would, I would argue that generally neither of those two tech specs is met. Uh, generally, we aren't confident that if they have the information, they'll do what we want. And there is something we want them to do, uh, in which case information turns out to be a, a fairly weak uh, uh, means toward an end that we haven't usually bothered to articulate very clearly. Uh, I, I started my communication career in the environmental movement and in, in a school of natural resources that was training future environmental propagandists. Um, and uh, environmental, you know, environmental people, as you know, if you hang out with environmental people, uh, have a lot of interest in and a lot of faith in the word awareness. Uh, and they kept saying to me, we're trying to increase environmental awareness. And that's a word much like information that I, I find hard to cope with. And I wound up saying, if to assume the topic is, let's say, endangered species, I wound up saying, well, all right, so suppose someone becomes aware of endangered species as a result of your communication, and they say back to you, now that I'm really aware of endangered species, I think it's really uninteresting, and I want nothing more to do with the endangered species issue ever again. Will you feel that you have succeeded in your awareness goal? Uh, and you know, their faces tended to fall because you know, they had an intuitive sense that that should not count as a success. Um, and of course, if that doesn't count as a success, then awareness is in fact not your goal. Uh, it's a means to your goal. Uh, and your goal is, I don't know, to get them to vote for a stronger Endangered Species Act or to, to get them to adopt a dinosaur. I mean, I'm not sure what your goal is, but it's got to be something behavioral or at least attitudinal, not, not mere awareness. And then whether awareness will help becomes an empirical question. Now, I should pause to say uh, this is a tough issue for those of you who think your field is or is going to be journalism. Uh, how many of you see yourselves as journalists, either in your heart or in your career aspirations? Okay, we, have, we have a few journalists. This is tough for you uh, because journalists are explicitly supposed to not care how the information gets used. Uh, you know, now in their heart of hearts, journalists do care how the information gets used, but they have very complicated intellectual Chinese walls. 
uh, to keep them from realizing that they care how the information gets used because that's the boundary between information and public relations, right? I mean, if you, if you have an actual goal, you're a PR person. Uh, but if you're just randomly spouting information, then you're a journalist. Uh, uh, and, and journalists somehow imagine that that distinction speaks to the ethical superiority of journalism over PR. Uh, and you know, we'll leave that for further discussion. But, 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 but I, I do see the problem for journalists in what I'm saying about information being a means to an end. For the rest of us who, who have actual goals, then it seems to me that you know, it's really not debatable that information is rarely our goal. It is a means to our goal. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the terms selective attention, selective retention, and selective perception. Uh, we, you know, I think somewhere along the line in an intro psych course, you kind of have to study that stuff. Uh, and it turns out that stuff is really important because what it tells us is that people are very good at not noticing stuff they don't want to notice. Uh, if they have to notice it, they're very good at misunderstanding it. If they have to understand it, they're very good at forgetting it. Uh, and, and there's a fourth that belongs right up there with selective attention and selective retention and, se and selective perception uh, that gets ignored because I don't know why. Uh, but it, 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 it seems to me every bit is important, and that's what I like to call still thinking. Uh, if you're forced to, to, to learn it, and you're forced to remember it, and you're forced to perceive it accurately, and it conflicts with things that you don't want to conflict with, you store it in some part of your head that's, that's separate from all the stuff you care deeply about, and you continue to say to people, I still think. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it, the evidence is very strong that we are all still thinkers. You know, that everybody in this room and everybody in this world is capable of acquiring information that conflicts with our prior opinions and with our deeply held values and with our current behaviors and somehow managing to sleep fine and not change those behaviors or those values. Okay. Um, now, sometimes we do that consciously, rather like children who uh, uh, put their fingers in their ears and say, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. Uh, but, but other times, and I think most times, it happens largely unconsciously. Uh, one might consider, for example, suppose you are a climate change skeptic. You are dubious that climate change is serious uh, for whatever set of reasons. Uh, and you know, what do you do with information that keeps coming at you that climate change is serious? You know, and there's lots of things you can do. You can, you can ignore it if, you, if possible. If, if forced to pay attention to it, you can misunderstand it. If forced to understand it, then you begin to come up with defenses, right? You can, you can dismiss it because it all comes from lefty ideologues. Uh, you can point out that uh, there are real flaws in the climate change models, uh, which indeed there are. Uh, it, what, you find ways to hang on to your belief that climate change is garbage uh, regardless of what pro-climate change information you receive. The same is exactly the same thing is true of climate change proponents uh, who are faced with information that suggests that maybe they're wrong and maybe climate change is nonsense. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the argument is equal. I'm not suggesting that the case for climate change and the case against climate change are identical. I am saying that both sides are equally immune to the other side's information. Okay. And this is indeed a fundamental principle of risk communication. We're all immune to information we don't want to learn. Uh, it's useful to think of your audience as falling into three categories. Category one is the people who aren't interested. They're apathetic. They don't want to learn because they have other things they're more interested in than what you're talking about. Uh, they're, they're not aggressively defended against you. They're passively defended against you because you know, there are more interesting things in the world than what you're trying to tell them. That's group one. Group two consists of people who are actively defended against you. They have very good reasons for not wanting to believe what you're trying to convince them of. 
Okay? And group three, these are not necessarily equal sized groups, but they always all three exist. Group three consists of people who are really on your side and are going to grab on to what you tell them because it, it supports their point of view. It makes them feel better about themselves. Group three are, are the people who you can count on to be enthusiastic uh, supporters in your audience. Group one is going to you know, check its emails. Uh, and, and group two is going to be busy telling themselves why you're full of crap. Okay. Does, does this make sense to everybody? The point that I'm making is there is no point in talking to group one or to group two until you have found a way to turn them into group three. Okay. And in, in all of communication, and especially in risk communication, we spend a lot more time, if we're knowledgeable, if we understand how these things work, spend a lot more time trying to convert group one and group two into group three than we spend trying to give group one and group two information. Group three, yeah, you can give them information. They will grab onto it and run with it. OK, I um, think that's all I want to say about that. But now I'm going to come at it for a, from a different point of view. The second principle is, uh, or principle, whatever, uh, rule of thumb, is harness cognitive dissonance. Now, raise your hand if you have heard of cognitive dissonance. That's great. You know, I mean, and raise your hand if it never occurred to you that it would ever be useful. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, cognitive dissonance is, is a, a theory invented in the 1950s by Leon Festinger and colleagues, uh, which I think is in many ways the keys to the kingdom uh, of much of risk communication. And I want to try to explain why. And I'm going to draw it. Let me start by drawing what we just talked about. Think of this as the educator's model or the journalist's model of how to change people. There's information. The information changes people's attitudes. And having changed attitudes, they change their behavior. Journalists like to imagine that this is true. College professors like to imagine that this is true. Presumably students like to imagine that this is true because you go to college. Um, and the only thing wrong with this is that it very, very seldom works for reasons that I have been talking about. So we're going to wall it off as a failure. Uh, you know, if, if, if we're redesigning humanity, we might try to make that work. That would be an interesting innovation. Uh, but humanity as, as we now exist, that doesn't work very often. So let me describe something that does work, just as simple. Okay. Step one is an irrelevant motivator, which triggers a need which changes behavior. Just as simple, three steps. But completely different, if, if this is the educator's model and the journalist's model, this is the product advertiser's model. Um, and I'll use an example that's not familiar to many of you because it's no longer advertised, at least no longer advertised in broadcasting. Uh, I was a smoker for many years. Uh, my cigarette of choice was Newports. Uh, the ads that hooked me on Newports were the ads I saw as a child growing up. Um, the main theme was smoke Newports in order to get the attractive woman or the attractive man, whichever you prefer, uh, by the Sylvan stream in the expensive convertible. These were ads showing you know, uh, people having a sexual uh, adventure that seemed to be working out much better than mine were. Uh, uh, you know, in a car that was much better than mine was, in a beautiful and natural environment that was much better than mine was. And there are, there are three needs there, right? Now, at least three. Needs around sexual success, needs around money and status and all the things that the, the convertible symbolizes, and needs around natural beauty. And what the ad apparently was saying is if you smoke Newport, you're going to get all of that. Okay. Now, absolutely no cognitive change takes place. That is, these are not ads designed to convince me that if I smoke Newport, I will be sexually more successful 
or I will be wealthier, or the streams will run cleaner. I, you know, by the time I was 14, I realized that it worked in the opposite direction with regard to all three of those variables. Uh, you know, so there's no cognitive learning there, and there doesn't need to be. The essence of what this is doing, it, it, it depends exclusively on the strength of the need and the frequency to with which that need is linked to the desired behavior. And the more frequently they trigger you know, my, my sexual needs and my income needs and my natural beauty needs and link it to smoking Newports, the more Newport smoking behavior they're going to get out of me without anything cognitive happening at all. Okay. And you know, I mean, there are there are extremely vivid examples of this. You know, not just in you know in the real world of advertising, but in all kinds of studies. Uh, but in the interest of time, the wonderful example in which they you know they get I'm going to give you the punchline without the study. A uh, wonderful study in which they get kids uh, to eat popcorn who are thirsty. Okay, simply by and by by posting on 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 the screen in the middle of a movie. Not, not subliminally, I mean, it just sits on the screen. Thirsty, eat popcorn. Okay. Uh, and you do that, and thirsty kids will eat more popcorn than not so thirsty kids. Uh, they also drink more. It's not like they've become stupid. They, you know, they, uh, you know, they understand that because they're thirsty, they ought to drink. But somehow, the thirstier they are, the more they hunger for popcorn because the, 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 the connection has been drawn for them. Okay. So this, this model doesn't work. It's very flattering to us, but it doesn't work. This model is a little insulting, uh, but it has the distinct advantage of working. Okay. Are you with me so far? Okay. I haven't mentioned cognitive dissonance yet. I'm about to. Okay. There's one problem with this model, and that is it's, it's, it's unstable. Okay. You're doing this behavior, but you don't know why. Okay. You know, there you are smoking Newport, you kind of know it's not actually helping you get the girl or get the guy. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be doing the job they promised. Uh, so there, there, you know, there is a name for the crappy feeling people have when they are engaged in the behavior for which they have inadequate attitudinal support. Okay. And that name is cognitive dissonance. So here I am doing something that doesn't make any sense even to me, and I therefore feel cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive dissonance is a discomfort. It, you know, it's a bad feeling. People try to get rid of the cognitive dissonance in their life if they possibly can. And the best way to get rid of cognitive dissonance is to look for and find information that makes sense of the new behavior. Okay? This is not random or, or, or uh, neutral information seeking. This is biased information seeking. You're looking for information that makes sense of your behavior. And this is the link between the two models. Now, we see a two-step process. Get them to do it for some idiotic reason. Okay. Let them feel cognitive dissonance. Let them look for information that what they did makes sense, and then meet that, that need, meet that cognitive dissonance with information. In this united model, instead of information being a challenge to their existing attitudes and behavior, information is a support for the brand new behavior that is lacking in attitudes. Okay. Is everybody with me? Okay. So, so, I mean, I, you know, we have saved rationality in the form of rationalization. Okay. Uh, everybody understand what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, we are not a rational species, but we are an extremely good rationalizing species. So if you can get people doing things, you can then teach them a great deal about why they did it. Uh, and a great deal of a great deal of successful communication, I think a great deal of, of, of risk communication, but all kinds of communication that's successful, is grounded in cognitive dissonance, in this two-step process of first motivating the behavior and second 
teaching people why the behavior makes sense. Now, I, I really want to underline, before I go on, I want to underline the irrelevance of the irrelevant motivator, which is not just you know, allowed, it's essential. It's the irrelevance of the irrelevant motivator that leads to the cognitive dissonance that leads to the information seeking. Uh, so that Festinger, who got all this started, uh, did a, a famous study back in the 1950s in which he paid people to give a speech that they didn't actually agree with. And I've forgotten the numbers, so I'm going to make up, and they were small numbers because it was the 1950s, so I'm going I'm to make up numbers for you, uh, and otherwise I'm describing the study accurately, I think. Um, and here's what he found. He found if you give people $1,000 to say something they don't believe, they will say it, and there will be absolutely no attitude change. They did it for the money. If you offer people a buck to say something they don't believe, they turn you down. You know, their integrity is worth more than a buck. But there is some sum of money between a dollar and a thousand dollars that is enough to get them to do it, but not enough to get them to think that's why they did it. Okay? So if you hit the sweet spot, if you find the right amount of money, you get them to give a speech they didn't want to give, and they experience all kinds of cognitive dissonance, and they look around for information that what they said in the speech was accurate, and you get a substantial amount of attitude change in people, you know, post-behavioral attitude change. First they give this, well, first you offer them the money, then they give the speech, then they say to themselves, can't be, I just did this for the money, I must, I must have must have done it because I believe in it, uh, and they come to believe in it. Now, if this makes sense to you, you will understand that in states where seatbelt laws were strictly enforced, attitude change in favor of seatbelts was slow because people said, I'm doing it so I won't get a ticket. In states where seatbelt laws weren't enforced at all, attitude change was slow because people didn't wear seatbelts. But states that got it just right, you know, got you to wear a seatbelt because you didn't want to get a ticket, but you didn't feel like that was a good enough reason, and you wound up thinking seatbelts were good for you. Okay, that's a very concrete, well-documented example of, of finding, you know, the place where the cognitive dissonance works for you. Okay. I need, I need to just mention the opposite of, cogn of, of harnessing cognitive dissonance, which is provoking cognitive dissonance you know, that you have no way of, of, of reducing. Uh, and that's what a lot of persuasive efforts do. Uh, and having mentioned climate change, uh, you know, I can use climate change as an example. I mean, a lot of environmental uh, communication essentially says to people, you know, it's your fault the world is going to hell in a handbasket. You're a consumerist son of a gun. You know, you like your damn SUV. Uh, you know, you're exactly the kind of person that is ruining the world for the rest of us. You know, the rest of us being the three vegans in the room. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a great deal of environmental communication that does that. And, you know, what, what is a normal human being's reaction going to be to being accused of being a jerk in all kinds of ways? You come up with defenses. You come up with reasons why the environmental movement is wrong. Uh, you marshal your, your intellectual and emotional defenses, and, and, and the communication backfires. See, now, instead of harnessing cognitive dissonance, they're just arousing cognitive dissonance. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're not using the dynamic strategically. Okay, any questions about any of that? Questions, comments, anything? All right, then I will go on. Number three is to accept that the, accepting, the, uh, accept that the upsetting part of risk isn't the hazard. Risk communicators spend a lot of time trying to convince other people that X is dangerous and Y isn't. Uh, and that they should therefore take precautions against X and not take precautions against Y. Uh, and grounded in the, that communication uh, is the error I already talked about of imagining that, uh, uh, that information is a powerful tool of change. Uh, but what's also grounded in it more specifically is a misunderstanding of how risk perception works. 
Uh, I am perhaps most famous as a, as a risk communication person for having drawn the distinction between two components of risk, and I'll, I'll draw this for you too. I'll move over to here. I said, all right, let's divide risk into its two components. Let's take the technical risk, how dangerous it is, how likely it is to kill you or hurt you or damage the ecosystem. Let's call that hazard. And then let's take the social component of risk, how likely it is to upset you, to anger you, to frighten you, and let's call that outrage. And I created the formula that sent my children to college, risk is equal to hazard plus outrage. That's all it took, tell your parents to eat their hearts out. Uh, and What's important here is not just that there are two components of risk, whether it's dangerous but, and also whether it's upsetting. What's important is that the correlation between those two components of risk is exceedingly low. If you know a risk is dangerous, that tells you almost nothing about whether it's upsetting. If you know a risk is upsetting, that tells you almost nothing about whether it's dangerous. Those of you who like numbers, the correlation is about 0.2 accounting for a glorious 4% of the variance. Those of you who don't like numbers, think of it as zero. It's close enough. Uh, very, very low correlation. Furthermore, interestingly enough, while the correlation between hazard and outrage, that is, whether it's dangerous and whether it's upsetting, is very low, it's also true that the correlation between hazard and perceived hazard is very low. But the correlation between outrage and perceived hazard is very high. Okay. That is, when people are upset, it is very likely that they believe the risk is dangerous. Now the question is, what's the direction of the causality? Are they upset because they think it's dangerous, or do they think it's dangerous because they're upset? Uh, and you know, sort of normal seat of the pants logic would say, well, I guess they must be upset because they think it's dangerous. That would be sensible of them. Uh, and that would be a nice information leads to attitude, leads to behavior kind of phenomenon. But it turns out that that's not what happens for the most part. It's a cycle. There are arrows in both directions. Uh, but the arrow from outrage to hazard perception is very strong, very robust. And the arrow from hazard perception to outrage is quite weak. So for the most part, it is not true, not true, that people are upset because they think a risk is dangerous. It's much more true that people think a risk is dangerous because they're upset. Outrage is the engine of hazard perception. Hazard perception is not the engine of outrage. And actual hazard isn't the engine of anything. I mean, hazard is important. I mean, don't get the impression I'm thinking it doesn't matter whether you kill people. Uh, but whether you kill people has very little effect on whether they think you're going to kill them. Uh, and very little, you know, and very little effect on how upset they are. Whereas whether they think you're going to kill them and how upset they are are yoked at the hip, but with a causal structure that's surprising to most people. You know, outrage is mostly the cause, and hazard perception is mostly the effect. Now you can take these two concepts, outrage and hazard, and graph them against each other and get the three main kinds of risk communication. Down here in this corner, we have high hazard, low outrage risks. You know, they're likely to kill you, they're not likely to upset you. Uh, smoking, not getting enough exercise, eating too much, you know, talking on your, on your cell phone. We guys don't talk on your cell phones anymore. Texting on your cell phone while you drive. Um, all those kinds of things are high hazard, low outrage risks. This is the venue of precaution advocacy. The paradigm here is watch out, this could kill you. Okay. And the essence of precaution advocacy is to try to increase the outrage. You try to increase the outrage in order to increase the hazard perception, in order to get people more willing to take precautions. In the opposite corner, wearing the black trunks, Low hazard, high outrage. 
People are upset even though they're not endangered. This is the venue of outrage management. If the paradigm here is watch out, the paradigm here is calm down. The message isn't calm down because calm down doesn't calm people down. You know, it's kind of an offensive message, but, the, but that's the goal. Uh, and another way of saying it is you're trying to reduce the outrage in order to reduce the hazard perception, in order to reduce the inclination to take precautions or demand precautions that you consider excessive. Over here, we have high hazard, high outrage. People are upset, and they're right to be upset because they are endangered. You know, the, the pandemic has started, and the case fatality rate is high, and a lot of us are going to die, and there's no <coughs> vaccine. Uh, or it doesn't have to be that bad, you know. The, uh, uh, the factory is shutting down, and, and uh, 20,000 people are going to be out of work, and uh, the community is going to go through a very tough economic time. High hazard, high outrage. This is crisis communication. Now, a lot of PR people call this crisis communication because it's a crisis for your organization, right? It's a, it's a reputation crisis for your organization if people think you're killing them even if you're not. But if you are killing them, then it's a real crisis. <laughs> okay. Um, these, are, these are the three principal kinds of risk communication. Down here in the fourth corner, you know, low hazard, low, low outrage. I have not found that to be a business opportunity. You know, I, I mean, what, what would you say to people? Congratulations on your apathy. You're absolutely right. This is true. Uh, very, very little to say when it's high, when it's low hazard, low outrage. Uh, but the other three, precaution advocacy, crisis communication, and outrage management, are three different kinds of risk communication ground, you know, with three very different toolkits, three very different sets of strategies for talking to people. But the distinction is grounded in the reality that hazard and outrage are completely different from each other and very uncorrelated with each other. So you, know, you start there uh, and you derive the three principal kinds of risk communication from that reality. OK, that said, I think I'm going to devote the rest of my time to giving you, you know, like one thing out of the precaution advocacy toolkit, one thing out of the outrage management toolkit, and one thing out of the crisis communication toolkit. There are dozens of strategies in each, three, e each of these three toolkits, uh, but I'm going to try and give you one per toolkit. Uh, so you will have three very sparse toolkits uh, when you leave the room. Um, and you know, from, from the many, many choices I had, the piece of advice I want to give you from precaution advocacy is be willing to scare people. Okay. Uh, there is in health communication generally and in public health generally uh, a tremendous fear of fear. My clients are endlessly saying to me, uh, I, I, I want people to take precautions, but I don't want to scare them which is a little bit like saying, you know, I want to write a novel, but I don't want to use the letter E. <laughs> it's, it's not impossible. It has, in fact, been done. Um, but it's a hell of a challenge. Uh, there's a nice quote from a 2003 Lancet article on SARS. You all remember SARS. Uh, that captures this very nicely. Uh, and here's the quote. The epidemic has shown the need for communication of risk that will inform and warn the public in a way that will improve personal protection without inducing raised anxiety and fear. That is the holy grail of precaution advocacy, to get people to take precautions without scaring them. And what we have to remember is the holy grail is mythical. Uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so is that goal. It, it is vanishingly difficult, nigh on impossible, it seems to me, uh, to get people to take precautions without scaring them. Well, that's an overstatement. You can pay them to take precautions. You can, 
say you're going to fire them unless they take precautions. You can point out that movie stars take those precautions. There are, there are other strategies available to you, but they're weak okay, compared to, the, to the, you know, the most powerful, most obvious way of getting people to take precautions, which is to scare them. So I want to say some things on behalf of fear. Okay? Uh, and and I'll, I'll run through these rather quickly. Point number one, don't overestimate the harm done by fear. It is true uh, that fear does some harm, particularly sustained fear does some harm. Uh, and that's what post-traumatic stress disorder is all about, is, is, is you know, fear that you don't come back down from uh, or you don't come back down from properly. Uh, so I'm, I'm by no means suggesting that fear is without harm. Um, but in general, but we, we overestimate how harmful it is for people to be frightened. And, and you know, sustained fear is very hard to achieve, uh, even when you want to. Uh, and by and large, when you frighten people, they calm down usually before you wanted them to, uh, and not very often after you wanted them to. A uh, second point is not to underestimate the good done by fear. Uh, just sort of remember the causal model that underlies all of this. You're trying to frighten people in order, which is to say increase their outrage, in order to motivate them to, well, let me get the middle variable. You're trying to increase their outrage in order to increase their hazard perception, in order to motivate them to take precautions. Uh, and you know, so I mean, you know, the, the, if you want people taking precautions, the good done by fear can, you know, is 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 very substantial. Uh, number three, don't imagine that fear can be avoided. Fear is inevitable uh, in response to new risks or risks that are newly known to you. Uh, number four, and this is an important one, don't settle for mere concern. Okay. If you want people to take precautions, concern won't do it. We have worry agendas. We all have worry agendas. Raise your hand if your worry agenda is insufficient. You need more things to worry about. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody sort of go, you know, walking through the world looking for more things to be upset about? Uh, this, is, this is very uncommon. Most of us have sufficient outrage in our lives already. We have sufficient worry, we have sufficient fear, we have sufficient concern in our lives already. If you're going to preempt something already in our lives, you're going to have to make it a bigger deal. Uh, so concern won't cut it. Uh, now, terror is too much. You know, if you, if you motivate terror, you have overshot. Uh, <laughs> you know, terrorists try to motivate terror. Uh, but fear, fear is the level of emotional arousal that produces the most precaution taken. Uh, and so if you're serious, fear is the goal. Uh, I would point out, by the way, that, that um, fear, fear is essentially a competition. Um, you know, people are as fearful as they are. Uh, there is a law of conservation of outrage. Uh, you know, you may be a more fearful person or a more easily outraged person than I am, but you're not a more easily outraged person than you were last month. Maybe last year before you were dean. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, by and large, our capacity for fear and our capacity for outrage, those are constants. Okay? And what we mostly do is reallocate that capacity. Uh, you know, so, you know, whatever, the American Cancer Society wants people to be afraid of cancer. Um, you know, the deodorant industry wants people to be afraid of body odor. Uh, you know, the environmental movement wants people to be afraid of factory emissions. Everybody has stuff they want people to be afraid of. Whatever you want people to be afraid of, if, you know, don't think of it as trying to turn them into more fearful people. We don't know how to do that anyway. Think of it as try to, trying to get your slice of the fearfulness pie, okay? Because they're going to be as fearful as they're going to be. But it, you know, it would be all right if they were a little bit more afraid of your issue and a little bit less afraid of body odor. That would be okay. Um, okay, I, I'm 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 going to skip some stuff because I only have a little while left, and I want to I want to give a piece of crisis communication and a piece of outrage management. And the piece of outrage management I want to give you is acknowledge the other side's truths. Now, I, I hasten to add, that's only a piece of outrage management. It is not a piece of precaution advocacy. If you are trying to scare people, you rarely need to acknowledge the ways in which it's not so scary. 
because the effort to scare people, we, we, we allow considerable uh, 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 leeway when people are trying to arouse alarm. They get to exaggerate, they get to dramatize. Okay? But when you're on the outrage management side, when you're trying to reassure, then you have to be persnickety, you have to be meticulous in acknowledging the other side's truths. Uh, everybody understand what I'm, what I'm talking about? It's not symmetrical. It's kind of like a smoke alarm. Uh, if a smoke alarm goes off when there's no fire, that's a minor problem. Uh, if there's a fire and the smoke alarm doesn't go off, that's a major problem. Okay. So you know we, we, we calibrate smoke alarms to go off too much so that they won't miss a fire. Uh, we similarly calibrate activists to go off too much. Um, and, you know, and if you ask the general public, does Greenpeace exaggerate, people will say yes. And if you say, is that a problem, they'll say, eh, not really, it's kind of their job. You know, and then you say, well, does Exxon exaggerate? Yes. Is that a problem? You bet, they should throw those bastards in jail. And, and the difference is Greenpeace is exaggerating how dangerous things are. Exxon is exaggerating how safe things are. And overstating risk is considered a public service. Overstating safety is considered a public disservice. So it's not symmetrical. This is particularly important for, let's say, the CDC. You know, when the CDC is talking about the danger of infectious diseases, it has considerable leeway. But when the CDC is talking about the safety of vaccines, then if it doesn't bend over backwards to acknowledge the other side's piece of the truth, it gets into trouble. Now, I'm a vaccine proponent. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I think most vaccines are safe uh, or relatively safe or safe enough or safe enough to want to use them when you need them. Uh, I am not a vaccine skeptic or a vaccine critic, um, but I am a risk communication expert. And what I know is if, if you're, you know, if, if, if the CDC is 98% right about the safety of some vaccine and 2% wrong, and it pretends to be 100% right and kind of hides the 2%, okay, Jenny McCarthy will cream them okay, with that 2%. You know, Jenny McCarthy doesn't have to admit the other 98% because she's trying to alarm people. They have to admit her 2% or they wind up looking very dishonest. And the, the strongest argument uh, in, the, in the arsenal of the anti-vaccination movement uh, is the failure of, of vaccination proponents to acknowledge the very small piece of the truth that the anti-vax people have right. Uh, I have talked myself out of having time to give you the example I wanted to give you. Um, you know, so if you want to stay after, I'm going to give you just enough of this to, to, to tempt you. If you want to stay after, we can talk in the hall about the fact that the polio vaccine that is used overseas, the oral polio vaccine that is used overseas, which is the right vaccine to use overseas because it's cheaper than the injected vaccine we all get. Okay? The oral vaccine is cheaper, and there, you know, for that reason and several other reasons, it's the right one to use in developing countries. But one time in a million, it gives you polio. Okay. Now, it's still the right one to use. But the World Health Organization and the CDC and Rotary and all the organizations that are involved in the campaign to, to eliminate polio systematically lie about the fact that, po that the polio vaccine, the oral polio vaccine, can give you polio. They lie about it because they think if they told the truth, parents wouldn't vaccinate their kids, and children will die if we tell the truth. And I argue back that children will die if the society begins to realize that you routinely don't tell the truth and stop trusting public health. It's a tough issue, and it's not just in, in, you know, in the developing world. Uh, there are plenty of, of dishonesties coming out of the public health profession every day here in the United States. Uh, that, that, you know, Jody and I, and we're not ethicists, I want, I want to be clear, you know, I, I, it, you know, it's not like honesty is my life's work. Um, you know, we're not ethicists. We are concerned that when public health is dishonest, it undermines public faith in public health. 
and the judgment that public health people tend to make that because we are good guys, because we are trying to save lives, because we are not doing this to get rich, we are doing this to save lives, we're allowed to be dishonest. You know, that is their assumption. Um, you know, when Jody and I publish critiques of their dishonesty, they don't call us up and say, you're wrong, as in, it's not so. They call us up and say, you're wrong, as in, you shouldn't be telling people this stuff, uh, because they have a deep conviction that the only way to do good public health is by being dishonest when necessary. And we have a deep conviction that that's, that's costing more and more and more. But all of this is an example of a very basic outrage management principle. You know, when you're on the reassuring side of a controversy, you have to bend over backwards to acknowledge the ways in which your critics are right. When you're on the alarming side of a controversy, you don't have to do that so much. And finally, see, I'm going to finish before nine, before five o'clock, before nine o'clock, before, <laughs> before five o'clock, Glenn. Um, finally, I'm going to skip all of some of this. Uh, and let me give you a piece of crisis communication. And the piece of crisis communication I want to give you is be willing to speculate. Speculation has had a very bad press. Uh, and, and organizations are endlessly saying, you know, nutty things like it's too soon to speculate. Uh, or, you know, we, we, we won't speculate. But, you know, I mean, try and say that to a weather forecaster. You know, I mean, you know, the, the hurricane looks like it's headed our way. And, you know, I just want you to imagine, you know, you turn on the weather channel and they say, here's where it is. We don't know where it's going. That would be speculation. Tune in tomorrow and we'll tell you where it went. <laughs> you know, and they don't do that. They don't do that. But n nor do they say, here's where it's going for sure. Okay? Because they don't know where it's going for sure. So we all know what weather forecasters do, or you know, what the weather channel does with a hurricane. They say, if it continues going in the direction it's now going in, here's, where, here's its path. But we don't think it will. We look at our models and we look at you know, all the, the data we have about air currents and whatnot, and it looks to us like it's going to bend this way. And here, here's a kind of a, an arc that represents our hurricane warning area. That's where we think it'll probably go. And here's a wider arc that represents our hurricane watch area. That's, that's wider because we're not real confident about our hurricane warning area. It might be outside that area. So if you're in the watch area, you ought to still pay attention. And even if you're outside the watch area, tune in tomorrow, when, you know, and you know, sometimes these suckers you know, act weird. Uh, so come back in a few hours and we'll, we'll let you know if there's anything new. And everybody in this room has seen that kind of forecast. And, and you don't say to yourself, my god, they're speculating. How dare they? You know, what you say to yourself is, you know, they're explaining the risk to us. You cannot do crisis communication without speculating. You, can't, you particularly cannot talk about potential future crises without speculating. Maybe after the crisis hits, you can just report the body count without speculating. Uh, uh, but useful crisis communication where you're saying what you think is going to happen and what you recommend people do in order to protect themselves has speculation built into it. So the notion that you shouldn't speculate is, is, is just crazy. Uh, and the people who say you shouldn't speculate don't mean it. You know, they can't mean it. So I've tried to figure out what they do mean. Okay? And what I think they mean is some kind of distinction between responsible speculation and irresponsible speculation. The most obvious point is responsible speculation sounds speculative. And irresponsible speculation sounds overconfident. So one of, one of the, the most important things to do when you're speculating is make it vividly clear to people that you're speculating. Uh, you try to replicate in other people's minds the level of uncertainty that you are actually feeling. You know? So that you, know, you wind up saying things like, 
you know, we think it's probably going to do this. You know, our, our, our best, you know, our, 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 our top hypothesis is x. That's what we think is likely. Okay? But we're also looking at y. That's really possible. And some of us think z might happen. z is kind of a dark horse. But you know, some of us are worried about z. We've pretty much eliminated a, b, c, d, and e. We don't, we'd be very surprised if any of those happen. x, y, and z are the principal contenders. Um, but we're not sure. So you're, you know, you're not saying you don't know anything, and you're not pretending you know more than you know. Uh, now, I, I, you know, Jody and I used to write articles with titles like Acknowledge Uncertainty. Uh, and we have come to think in recent years that acknowledging uncertainty isn't good enough because uh, both the audience and the media tend to ignore acknowledgments of uncertainty. So we have replaced acknowledge uncertainty with proclaim uncertainty. Uh, you really have to bend over backwards to insist that you're not certain. Um, you know, and you, you, know, you have to kind of go after uh, reporters uh, who cover you in a tone that suggests that you know more than, than you know. Uh, that's half of responsible speculation, to acknowledge your uncertainty. The other half of, of, of responsible speculation is to focus more on, the, on, on what you're worried about than on what you're hoping for. The two dominant questions people ask their surgeon or their plumber, the two main questions, the first question is, what do you think is likeliest? And the second question is, what are you worried about? What do you think is likeliest? You know, what's, the, what's the likeliest scenario? What, what do you think is more likely to happen than any other scenario? But the other question, and these two are equally important, the other question is, what's your worst case scenario? Not your literal worst case scenario. You know, your literal worst case scenario is not only is there a pandemic, but the Martians choose that day to invade. Uh, you know, the, the, the literal worst case scenario is always unrealistic. You know, you can always make it worse. So what, 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 we, we, what we ask our doctor or our plumber isn't what's the worst it could possibly be. It's what are you worried about? What's likely enough that it's on your mind that's bad? Okay. Everybody agree, those, those are the two things we want the answers to. It's exactly the same in any crisis. So you divide in, in, in crisis speculation, you divide your time between the likeliest scenario and the worst case scenario that isn't vanishingly unlikely. And then you save a little bit of time for the optimistic scenario, just in case it fizzles you don't want to be accused of not having noticed it might. So you know, it's like, it's like uh, you know, 45% of your time on what's likeliest, I'm making up these numbers, don't write them down for God's <laughs> sake. It's 45% of your time on what's the likeliest thing to happen, 45% of your time on what's the worst thing that you're worried about happening, and 10% of your time on wouldn't it be wonderful if it went out to sea? You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if if it turned out not to be a pandemic after all. I mean, whatever, whatever the fizzle scenario is, acknowledge it so that you're not accused of hyping the, the crisis if the fizzle scenario materializes. But that's not where the focus belongs. OK, what, you know, what I've done is I hope what I promised to do, I've given you, you know, a, 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 an airline magazine view of risk communication. A little bit of precaution advocacy, a little bit of crisis communication, a little bit of outrage management, a little bit of the underlying theory in terms of risk equals hazard plus outrage, a little bit of Leon Festinger, a little bit of skepticism about the, the uh, sad truth that information is pretty close to worthless until you have given people a reason to want it. Uh, that is not all of risk communication. It's not even a coherent introduction to risk communication because I got permission from Glenn not to be coherent. Um, <laughs> But it's a nice, it's a kind of a risk communication stew. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, see me after uh, outside, because this room is going to get used. Uh, if you have questions and you don't want to stay and talk to me, go look at my website. Thank you so much.